Chernasco, nor a volcanic eruption stops the catching of the little fish that catch the big fish. We're after 300 tons of tuna. John Gunther's High Road. Your host narrator is the distinguished journalist who has interviewed the world's leaders and the people they lead for his famous best-selling Inside Books. And now, here is Mr. Gunther. How do you... What we're going to do is join a tuna hunt. We're going to see the unbelievably engrossing story of a crew of fishermen out of San Diego on a tuna clipper go out into the Pacific and confront obstacles that one can scarcely imagine in the waters off Panama, the Galapagos Islands, and Peru. We're going along with 12 rugged fishermen who harvest the high seas, not for sport, but for hard business. They're after the most unpredictable, difficult, baffling, fiercely fighting fish in the world, tuna. It all begins here at Dockside. This is our tuna clipper. For its crew of 12, it's going to be a home, a church, a corner drugstore for four long months. And who are these 12 dedicated gamblers? The skipper is Joaquin Quaylen. Knowledge of the sea and the men who go to sea is part of Joaquin's Portuguese heritage. A mistake with either a man or a boat can turn the tuna hunt into a grim news item. A moment of prayer for added strength and wisdom. And here comes his crew, specialists all. A bait man. An engineer. A radio man. A cook with a sense of humor. He'll need it. No matter what he cooks, there'll be criticism. You know how cooks on ships are. The mast man or lookout. A navigator. A carpenter. A net man, who's also the ship's music man and in charge of the flea powder for the ship's mascot, Susie. The ship, too, all 180 feet of it, is a specialist. It has mechanical eyes and electronic voices. This is the wheelhouse, the compass, to help her find her way, day or night, the latest direction finders and radar equipment. Yes, it's a magnificently articulated collection of floating hardware, and underneath are immense refrigerated compartments. The job, to fill these innards with 300 tons of tuna. That's $100,000 worth of fish. Members of the crew get their supplies aboard, enough for four months. <coughs> they make their hasty farewells. Underway, heading south. The clipper's horns sound a final salute. the open Pacific. Joaquin had decided on his course days ago when his cousins, who were also tuna clipper captains, radioed that the tuna were jumping into the boats off the coast of Panama. If we don't find fish there, we'll move on to the strange equatorial islands of the Galapagos. If we fail again, we've got a big decision to make. Turn for home, or go on all the way to Peru as a last resort. A 
clipper captain is only as good as his last trip. The warm waters of Panama are still 10 days ahead. The captain's cousins know tuna, and we can trust them sometimes. But we also know that nothing is going to jump into the boat without bait. That's the key to tuna, bait, live bait. Nobody knows why, but porpoise always travel with tuna. So we begin by looking for porpoise. So does Susie. But first, we've got to have bait. Without bait, all we get is a demonstration in swimming from the porpoise. It's odd, we always see porpoise exactly halfway to the bait grounds off Panama. Maybe they're leading us in. Each time we wonder how they manage to swim the way they do. The radio operator keeps busy asking questions. How's the weather? Where's the bait? How's the fishing? Two days out, and the stormy petrels pick us up, looking for a handout. Sorry, Sonny, no fish aboard yet. And that's the truth from one fisherman to another. But hang around and find some bait fish for us. Birds and porpoise make us feel lucky even though we haven't got our bait yet. But so far, so good. The long green rolling prairie seems tilted downhill. Even the weather is in our favor. But only a landlubber trusts weather at sea. As for the bait fish, they're the most unpredictable thing that swims, except for tuna. We're only 200 miles from Panama now, and it's a good idea to get out our gear, the tools of our trade. We pick out bamboo poles that we like as carefully as a big league ball player selects his bat. It's got to feel just right. We file off the rough edges and sand the pole. If a wild tuna gets stubborn and decides to take the pole with him, none of our fingers are going along. So much for the leverage department. Now for the business end. This is not an ordinary fish hook. It has no barb. That's so that we can flip the tuna over a shoulder, he drops off the hook right into the bin, and we can cast for the next without interruption. And the hook's got real fish appeal. Skirted in chicken feathers, it'll look in the water just like the tuna's favorite diet, squid. When things get hot, the tuna don't examine the hook too closely, they just bite. And the more often they bite, the more often our families eat. One man with one pole can handle a fish weighing from 20 to 40 pounds. The hook gets bigger for fish from 70 to 100 pounds, and two men work a single hook. When tuna get to be over 100 pounds, they need extra coaxing. It takes the power of three men, three strong men, with three poles tied to a single hook. Yes, here's the lure, the little beauty that's going to get them. But this is all conversation until we find bait. The man of war bird is ready. He knows something's up. He knows that when we start checking our acre of net, that we'll be hauling in bait in a few hours with luck. Now we start sniffing for bait. The signs are right. There's a sky full of birds and a sea chock full of porpoises. At dawn, we crawl, creep over dangerous shoals and shifting sands. We're in shallow water now where the bait should swarm. Right on schedule, a hungry gull tips us off. Live bait. How much? The gulls don't know. We've got to find out for ourselves. The kind of bait we get here is a lively little fish called an anchoveta. We'll haul thousands of them back alive in the big white receiver. Eventually, they'll be thrown to the hungry tuna. 
There's nothing so appetizing to a tuna as an anchoveta. The tuna go after them so greedily that they bite anything else that happens to be moving, even a steel hook and chicken feathers. Assembled, the bait team takes off. First, a power skiff. Next, the receiver, which will be submerged when loaded with bait and towed back gently, very gently, like a giant aquarium. Most of the men who are in the skiff ride with the net, a whole acre of net. And finally, the man with the bucket, tail end, Charlie bringing up the rear. There's more than just the bait to think about now. Those clouds look menacing. And incidentally, what's happened to all the rest of those birds? The lookout, the pathfinder, tells us to wait. We want to be very, very sure where we drop the net. There had better be fish underneath it. Here's the spot. We make a big circle. The net looks like an old-fashioned lady's purse, enormously magnified. The purse is the fine mesh or sack of the net. And when it's pushed off halfway around the circle, the cry of sacco will tell the motorboat operator to swing around and close the circle. Close the net, tie it off. The circle is complete and we are tied off. The bait is trapped. We start pulling the net in and wonder why the birds aren't still around. By this time, the water should be boiling with anchovetta. Circle tightens, a few small fish jump, that's all. Here's the rest of the catch. Maybe a dozen scoops. That may be bait for a Sunday afternoon fishing picnic back home, but not for the kind of fishing we have to do. There's no point in loading a catch as miserable as this. We need a thousand scoops, two thousand, not a dozen. So we dump it. The shark would have been better off if he hadn't come along at just this moment. Now we have to wait and try again, nothing else to do. Four miles away, Joaquin looks on impassively. He's disappointed, but doesn't show it. The sea has been fickle before. Our problem is simple, isn't it? We need 300 tons of tuna, and we haven't got one. And before we can start getting tuna, we have to have a thousand scoops of anchovetta. So we try again five, six, seven times. Just as long as the sea doesn't kick up, we'll keep right on chasing anchovetta. Here's the complaint department. A tuna clipper captain must be understanding, must know his men, and be a practical psychologist. The pathfinder tells him there's no sign of bait in the water, and the clouds don't look good. Maybe we should fold the net. Joaquin's answer is simple, get that net back in the water. Out we go once more, repeating the same old process. A fine way for grown men to be spending their time chasing a four-inch fish, but we have to have the four-inch fish before we... Funny, only not so funny. But they'll be back. They're still right under us. They'll take the chum, but they're not taking the hook. 
they'll start again. They usually do. Only this time, they don't. Not a very good beginning, but it is a beginning. All we need now is another 297 tons. We can get it in three days, or a week, or 16 weeks. Or we can also go home empty. Keen, our skipper, knows what's wrong. He can smell it, feel it, hear it. There's the answer. We all know what that is. It's the Chubasco again, the fiercest of local Pacific storms. They're like love affairs between a Kansas tornado and a monsoon. We're not sticking around for the honeymoon. Better get out of those racks. They're a little on the leaky side. isn't enough. You've got to know how, and you don't get a second chance. For the moment, you're more important than a tuna. The pressure's dropping. We have to move fast. A new course. Get around the edge of the storm. Get a little rain. And the men get a bath in fresh water. We wait. Islands sit bleakly on the equator with their insides full of molten lava. features in the life of a Pacific tuna fisherman is dodging volcanoes, but this seems to be too much. Hot rocks. Storms. Volcanoes. These spectators are some of the beachcombers of the Galapagos. Fishing in the Galapagos means working very close to the rocks, weaving through little islands, dodging shoals. We're hunting for signs of tuna. Here's one sign. There are the birds. And here are the tuna. Real, live, money-making tuna. We should have fish. 
fish are bored by this time. But the birds are stealing all the chum. The fish don't get a chance at it. But we can beat this by sinking the bait on our hooks. That's fishing the hard way. And we pick up more than just a tuna. Dolphin, bad luck. A barracuda, vicious man-eater. Well, the ocean's big. up the road a piece. just wants to prove to his wife that he's been fishing. Here we are. We're sitting over one of the best spots in the Galapagos, chasing gulls away instead of hauling in tuna. Eight weeks, eight more tons. It isn't enough. Now the skipper faces a really critical decision. What should he do? What's going to be the next move? Home by Christmas? Without a load of tuna, it won't be Christmas. Not for the family. He's made his decision. Peru. We're going to Peru, and maybe our luck will change. Off the coast of Peru, the depths have to be measured electronically. The tuna work way down at the bottom. One, two, three days and nights on this same spot, and a fourth coming up. The thunder on the planking continues. We've made it. But let's take a few more tons to make up for the shutouts in Panama and the Galapagos. Now the engineer says we've got to stop. One more tuna and we'll sink. That's it. Wrap it up. And back to San Diego, back home. Home in time to buy a Christmas tree.